Well, good day, everyone. I hope you're doing as well as can be expected. Again, under the circumstances, which don't seem to change much from day to day, I guess they get worse, but uh, we'll uh, try to look on the bright side. Uh, what we're going to do in this uh, lecture or set of lectures is talk about uh, occupancy models, patch occupancy models, which really have emerged uh, in a big way in the estimation game over the last uh, 15, 20 years or so. And I wanted to take an opportunity to introduce uh, you to the basic ideas behind uh, occupancy models, because for a lot of purposes, they're going to be very relevant. And as we'll talk about a little bit later on, and they're sort of acutely relevant uh, right now because occupancy models actually can provide a good framework for looking at uh, disease dynamics. Uh, and for sort of obvious reasons, that's kind of current at the moment. All right, so let's begin. What do we mean by occupancy models? Well, we're going to split what we're going to do into a couple of pieces here. Uh, we're going to largely look at a single season and then what are known as dynamic and multiple season occupancy models. And single season models are very, very closely aligned with the closed population abundance estimation models that we looked at uh, earlier. And the dynamic and multi-season sorts of uh, models where you're looking at the degree to which occupancy changes from year to year are based upon the robust design, which we looked at uh, very recently. Um, because of the circumstances we find ourselves in for the remainder of the semester and things related to that, uh, we're going to skip talking about some of the more advanced models, so specifically multi-species models, multi-state, multi-scale, and some of the newer advances. So we're going to skip those all together. We're going to focus in on single season and multi-season models, and both of those are covered in some detail in chapter 21. So chapter 21 you're going to be reading from. Chapter 22 is there for reference for people who are engaged and want to look further, but we're not going to cover those specifically in class. So the occupancy game really took off in the early 2000s uh, when a couple of individuals that are represented here, in particular, Daryl McKenzie. Some of you have seen a recent video of Daryl uh, talking about correcting counts for detection probability. Jim Nichols, Jim Hines, Andy Royal, who's pictured down here, Ken Pollock, and um, Paul Doherty, who's out of Colorado State. Uh, these are papers that sort of emerged in um, very early 2000s. And then very, very quickly, it just sort of took off. And within maybe three or four years, they had enough new ideas, new results to publish the first edition of the Occupancy book, which is represented here with these pronghorn antelope on the cover. And then more recently in 2017 uh, was the second edition of the book, which is about twice the length uh, representing the, um, the number of advances that have occurred between uh, 2006 and 2017. And this is the second uh, edition of the book here, uh, also primarily written by the same authors. So this is a huge field that's emerged. And the, the basic idea that motivates occupancy models is something that we touched on a little bit in 3100. Uh, estimating abundance uh, seems reasonable when you talk about population dynamics in terms of changing uh, abundance, but um, actually looking at how many animals there are is, is a technical challenge in terms of estimation. Uh, it's a lot easier to ask the following question, is a particular patch or habitat location uh, occupied by at least one individual of a species? And so what patch occupancy models do is they provide a statistical framework for parameterizing um, metapopulation models, where instead of talking about DNDT, change in N over time, we talk about uh, the change in the proportion of patches occupied over time. And in, for those of you who remember some of those lectures from 3100, uh, what we're basically going to do now is, is look at how do you actually estimate some of the parameters that go into that kind of modeling framework. But again, the basic idea is that patch occupancy models have some advantages in terms of uh, being applicable to situations where it's going to be really hard to estimate abundance. And that's particularly true when you're trying to look at dynamics of things over very, very large spatial extents. It's going to be very difficult to come up with reasonable estimates of abundance, but it's a lot more straightforward to come up with estimates of whether or not the patch is occupied because we define it as having simply one member of a species. So there's a lot of different questions that rely heavily on occupancy data. So for example, questions about the geo geographic range of species. If you think of any sort of species distribution map that you might look at, the question is, 
uh, how do they do those maps? And so uh, is a particular location on the map occupied or not? Uh, and that's, that's what determines the, the range extent on the maps that you see. Habitat relationships and resource selection. So as we consider manipulating habitat for management uh, and conservation of species, we need to know something about the relationships of, of the habitat attributes and whether or not those patches of habitat are going to be used. Metapopulation dynamics, which I mentioned a moment ago. Large-scale monitoring is really where I think occupancy got the most traction because an awful lot of agencies and various levels of government are charged with looking at changes in species distribution and species dynamics uh, over very large spatial and temporal scales. That's really, really hard to do with a simple classic um, mark recapture experiment, um, but it is something that's tractable with an occupancy uh, example, or uh, excuse me, an, an occupancy framework. And so that's the kind of thing that, that I think really took off. I remember meeting a couple of, of uh, students at a workshop I was giving out in Alberta at one point, and they, uh, I was going through all the standard kind of mark recapture stuff, and they kind of looked a little disappointed uh, with what they were hearing, and I sort of asked them at lunch, and and then they said, "Well, you know, none of that's going to work because we're supposed to be uh, looking at the dynamics of a couple of different passerine species over the entire boreal forest region of Canada, and the boreal forest region of Canada by itself is bigger than the contiguous 48 states of the United States. So, trying to do a mark recapture study on something in that scale was just purely not practical." And I said, "Well, there's good news for you. We have this new." tool, and at the time it was relatively new, called patch occupancy, which will potentially provide a, a mechanism for you to address the questions you're interested in, and, and they were quite happy with that. And in fact, people like that is, is where this has really taken off. Um, it's also extremely useful for species interactions. So presence or absence of different species uh, allows you to potentially infer something about species interactions, competition structures. Uh, are there relationships between habitats and different species? And, and the one that I tacked on here, because it's clearly relevant for our personal and uh, current circumstance, epidemiology, uh, an individual is either occupied by the pathogen or it isn't. Uh, and a patch occupancy model is exactly what you want to do. The proportion of patches, i.e. the proportion of hosts that are occupied by the pathogen, pathogen is prevalence. And so proportions is uh, occupied is what occupancy does. So there are very interesting, very important, very direct and real applications of patch occupancy models for epidemiology. Unfortunately, most of the epidemiological community is a little bit slow on the uptick for this, basically because they don't take courses which are largely motivated by wildlife modeling technologies, even when they happen to be particularly relevant. But I suspect given current circumstances, um, the interest will increase uh, significantly. Okay, so here's the basic problem that we're going to address with occupancy data. Uh, you go out and you're going to conduct what's traditionally been called a presence or absence survey. Now, given where we are in the course, uh, we should understand that presence or absence is, is more accurately referred to as detection or non-detection. So if you go out and you um, observe the presence of a species of interest in a, a particular location where you're looking, um, then you know it's there. In other words, you detected it. If you don't detect it, well, we know now that there's two interpretations for an absence. It's either absent because it really wasn't there, or it's absent or appears absent because you didn't detect it. So presence absence is traditional. It, it stems from uh, island biogeography. MacArthur and Wilson did this many, many years ago at this point. And presence absence still sort of predominates in what I'll call the classic ecological literature. But in point of fact, we really ought to try to replace that with detection and non-detection. Um, now, again, in the old days, and, and I don't mean to disparage uh, approaches before because you know we, we have new technologies now, we understand things a little bit differently, but there was an awful lot of focus on looking at presence absence and almost all of the really clever inference was based upon pretending that non-detection equaled the true absence. Uh, and it either ignored detection altogether, or it assumed that it was constant across uh, time and space. And if you just think about it for a minute, that seems pretty silly now, and maybe it seems even more silly given where you are in, in the course, but the idea that all species are equally detectable, 
and that you should be able to detect things equally well in a forest versus uh, an open field just seems, you know, a little bit silly. And, and yet an awful lot of the classical presence absence stuff, a lot of the very early island biogeographic stuff was based upon pretending that a non-detection either meant true absence or it was something you could ignore because you just assumed it was constant over space and time. Um, we now know uh, that that's not really a good idea. It, it often causes bias in estimates of species <laughs> occurrence and occupancy dynamics and the factors that influence both. All right, so here's the, the basic field situation. Um, from some very large population of, of, of capital S sampling units, so let's just say that uh, capital S represents all possible locations where you might be looking for a species, um, you select some subsample. So some subsamples, small s, are selected and surveyed in some fashion for the target species. All right, so the simplest field situation, the one we need to start with, is that we assume that the units are closed to changes in occupancy during a sampling period. Okay, so we call that a season. And so remember what we mean by closure. We mean by closure that nobody's coming in and nobody's going out. Now, it means something a little bit different in an occupancy study. And, and one of the things that we want to mention now, and we'll mention it several times as we move forward, when we talk about a, a patch being occupied by at least one individual of a species, when we look at it multiple times, we're not assuming that it's the same individual. We're assuming it's the same species. So you could go out to patch today and you could see Martha and you could go out to a patch tomorrow and you could see uh, Fred. Uh, they're the same species, but they're different individuals. That doesn't matter. The occupancy state is a species specific uh, state. And so all we're saying is that the units are closed to changes in occupancy during a sampling period, not that they're closed to the individual. So individuals can move in and out, but that the actual true state occupied or not doesn't change. The units must be repeatedly surveyed within a season. We know why that's important. You can either do that with multiple visits or observers. We know it's important because without multiple um, visits, you cannot explain the absences. You can't explain the zeros. You need to have multiple encounters in order to determine whether or not the zero means an absence or whether the zero is a non-detection. Now, what we'll see in the second part of this lecture is that these units Okay, so these um, collection of different uh, places where you're looking can be surveyed over multiple seasons. And those are what are known as multi-season models. And they're based upon the robust design, which we also looked at. We're gonna start though with simple single season uh, occupancy modeling because it's very, very closely aligned with the uh, abundance estimation stuff that we did earlier. So here's the basic you know, structure. Again, it's a closed population sample. We imagine that we sample some um, set of, of locations t times in one season. And, and if it helps you to keep track of what we mean by season, you could just say within a particular year. And, and again, a reminder, the closure is at the species level, not the individual level. So we imagine that while we're sampling, that the true state of, this, of each patch in the system is not changing. So this is the closure assumption. So a single season, single year, you go to multiple locations and you sample them. So to provide a, a kind of a mental reference point, a visual image, imagine that you're looking at uh, frog um, presence or absence or detection, non-detection in a series of ponds. Okay, so let's say there's 10 ponds. And every day for, let's say, four or five days in a row, you go visit those ponds and you do whatever kind of sampling you need to do to see if you can detect the particular frog species that you're interested in. Okay, so what we're gonna assume for a single season um, occupancy model is that during those four or five days, that the actual occupancy state, the true occupancy state of each of those 10 ponds doesn't change. So that if it has frogs on the first day, it has frogs on the second day, and the third day, fourth day, however many days you're sampling, so it's closed. However, that doesn't mean that every day that you go and look at a particular pond that you actually will detect it. And that's the point. So just like a standard closed population uh, marker capture study, we know that the 
individual animals there, we simply detect it or not with some probability. Well, here we're assuming that the, the state of the occupancy of the pond doesn't change. So it's always there and we simply detect it or not. Okay, so what do the data actually look like? Well, imagine that we have s, again, small s number of units. So again, if you want, just to provide the, met or to, to be consistent with the mental image, imagine that each of these is different ponds. So you have one, two, three, up to s ponds that you're looking at. And you either do uh, four surveys in a row, or maybe you have um, four observers that go out on a particular day and you look at the ponds in some random independent way and then you record your data. Now, what are, what are the data that you're recording? Well, again, this shouldn't be too new to you. It's a one if you detect at least one individual uh, of the species in the pond and a zero if you don't. So if we look at this first pond here, unit one, it's a one, zero, one, zero. So we know that we detected it on the first visit. We didn't detect it on the second, but we did detect it on the third. And, and we didn't detect it on the fourth. Now, because these are closed, we can unambiguously interpret both of these zeros. So the zero in the second survey or by the second observer simply means that they didn't detect it. We know it's there. The true state doesn't change. Okay, if detection probability was a one, then you would have one, 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 one. But because P is less than one, typically, sometimes when you go out, you simply don't detect them. So we know what to, to how to interpret the second zero, and we know how to interpret the fourth zero. Unit two, we did detect them every time we went out. Unit three, we did, we didn't, we didn't. And then you'll see these dashes. Well, they're, they're all supposed to be dots, uh, not dashes. Let me, let me go ahead and change that right now, because I'll forget to do it later, and I don't want to confuse things right now. OK. So one of the things that you can do, not just with occupancy modeling, but with a lot of different data types uh, in MARC, is if you don't actually go to the site on a particular day, your truck boat broke down or something happened, um, you can simply put a dot in the encounter history file. And what that will tell Mark to do is to say, OK, well, on that day, uh, you didn't go to that pond, so in pond three here. And so the detection probability uh, is 0. So Mark knows that and, and deals with that internally. OK, so you can have ones and zeros just like a normal encounter history. And then you can also have these dots to indicate when you didn't go to a site. So here's really what we're trying to do. OK, so imagine each of these little squares represents a pond or some site that you're going to go visit. And let's say that the purple ones are the ones that are um, occupied and the, the white ones are the ones that aren't occupied. All right, so the biological reality is this lower layer here. So this is what we would call the biological layer. And then above it is the observation layer. And so if you look at, for example, this lower left-hand um, purple block, it's occupied. You go out on three different occasions, and it's 101. So you, you missed it on the second occasion. OK, here's one, the one that I'm looking at here on, in this first row. It's also occupied, and you actually did see it every time. But what about this other one, this one that I'm, I'm circling right now with, with the laser pointer? It's occupied, but you went out three days in a row, and you didn't detect it. So it's 0, 0, 0. So this is the main difference between a closed population abundance estimation modeling exercise and occupancy modeling. In closed population abundance ex exercise, you never record data for the individuals that you don't see. All right, there are no zero, zero, zeros in your encounter file because how could you record them if you don't see them? In a closed population abundance model, you're actually trying to estimate the number of individuals that you actually missed every time you went out to sample. In the occupancy situation, on the other hand, because you are visiting a patch, a physical location, it is possible for you to have an encounter history that is zero, zero, zero. And that's useful information. And that becomes important later on when we build a probability model. So try to keep those two things in mind. In a closed population abundance estimation, we don't see the zero, zero, zeros. In an occupancy study, we actually do. Okay, and they represent something that's useful to us as we build our, our data likelihood. All right.
So here's a little kind of a thought question for you, um, just to get your brain sort of thinking here. Um, we have two different studies, study one and study two. Each study um, has uh, 10 different locations, so 10 different ponds, and you visit each of those ponds three different times, okay? And you record a one or a zero, so we won't deal with you know, any dots for this. We'll assume you made it to every single pond, every single time out of those three sampling events. And some of them are zero, zero, zeros. And so the question for you would be, in which study is the zero, zero, zero history most likely to be a false absence? Study one or study two? Now, pause the video for a second here and think about it. What do you know from these? Well, if you stare at them, you'll see that study one has a lot of 111s and a lot of 101s, uh, whereas study two has a lot where the individual uh, species was only detected once. We don't have any where it was detected all three occasions. Uh, we don't even have any that were detected twice. We simply have a bunch where they were detected at least once, and then these two down here at the bottom where they weren't detected at all. Study one, there's lots of situations where you detect them on all three occasions. So think about it for a second and ask yourself the following question. Among the two studies, in which study is the 000 history most likely to be a false absence? Well, what do we mean by false absence? Well, false absence is one where it's occupied, but we simply didn't detect it. Okay, so in which of the two studies is the 000 individual patches likely to actually have been occupied. We just didn't detect it. All right, so pause the video and think about it for a second, and then we'll come back. Okay, we're back. Um, I'm back. I never really left. So if you think about it carefully, hopefully you came to the conclusion that study two is the study in which 000 is most likely to be a false absence. Okay, so in this situation, because P is clearly lower, then you're going to be much more likely to have 0, 0, 0 occur by random chance, um, even though the patch is actually going to be occupied. Okay, so if you don't fully understand that, just take a moment and work through it, and, and I think you'll, you'll get it. And if, and if you still don't understand it, shoot me an email, and I'll, and I'll provide some more details. Okay, well, here are the details. I forgot I put this slide in. Uh, so let's explain why this is true. So I made the claim that uh, study one is higher P, and I guess if you stare at it, it seems intuitively obvious. Uh, the second study is lower P, and let's look at exactly uh, why that would lead to the conclusion that study two, the zero, 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 is more likely to be a false absence. All right, so just to put some numbers in it, just to demonstrate the point, let's let the probability of detection of the species for study one, uh, the high P study, be 0.6, and for the low P study, study two, be 0.3. So what's the overall probability of a 0, 0, 0 encounter history? For the high P, it's simply 1 minus 0 0.6 times 1 minus 0 0.6 times 1 minus 0 0.6, so 0 0.0064. So if we assume that the detection probability is a constant, which is what I'm doing here, then the probability in study one of getting a 0, 0, 0 uh, history, even when it's occupied, is, is 0 0.064. So there's a 6% probability of observing that. On the other hand, for the low probability study, if we say that it's 0.3, we assume it's constant, then the probability of observing uh, this is 0.343. Okay, so there's a many, many fold uh, increased probability of a false absence for study two versus study one, given these values here, even though the value detection probabilities are only uh, different by a matter of, of a half. So 0.6 is, is, is a, twice as big as 0.3, or 0.3 is half of 0.6. Um, because they're being multiplied together, the overall probabilities of those events aren't simply doubled. Um, they're, they're many orders of magnitude. They're, they're basically exponentially uh, or geometrically uh, bigger. Okay, so this is something that we need to understand. So we, what we're basically trying to do then is model the probabilities and try to get information out of these zero, zero, zeros. Okay, so to do that in an occupancy model, we introduced uh, really one new parameter and, and, and resurrect a, a standard parameter that we're used to by now. So in an occupancy model, um, the, uh, in a single season model, but we'll also see it in a uh, multi-season model later on, uh, 
psi is the probability that a unit is occupied. Okay, so we use the Greek letter psi uh, to indicate that a unit's been occupied. And for those of you who remember the 3100 lectures, that's the reason that I use the psi parameter uh, in that class, because for those of you who are going to take 4120, you would see it again, and here it is. And psi is the parameter that's used in the, in the occupancy literature. And then P uh, sub J is the probability that a species detected at a unit in survey J, given that it's occupied. Okay, now it's, it's probably useful to note that this P sub J is in fact a product of availability and detection, which is similar to the P uh, that we saw in the robust design. So it's, it's got to be there and then it's got to be detected. We can't really pull that apart in a robust design, but I just wanted to mention that just to provide some consistency and some connection back to the robust design stuff. I mean, we can't pull that apart in, a, in an occupancy stuff, but we can in a in the, in the robust design in that context. Okay, so what do we need to do here? Well, we need to remember that given the P that uh, species is detected in a particular survey, something that we introduced in the closed population abundance modeling, P star, is something that we need to think about again. What's P star? It's the probability that the species in this case is detected at least once. So here's the probability that it's not detected on a particular sampling occasion. This is the product over however many occasions that you're sampling. Okay, so we go back here. This term here, like one minus 0.6 times one minus 0.6 times one minus 0.6, that's basically this term here. That's the product, that's the product um, uh, operator. And so if this is the product of being missed, uh, you know, J times, then one minus that is the probability of being detected at least once. And for a patch to be occupied in a closed population study, like an occupancy, single season occupancy study, you only need to detect it once. So P star is the relevant uh, parameter that we need. So let's look at uh, an example here where we imagine we have uh, four surveys and we'll assume that the species detection probability is constant and it's 0.4 for each of those four surveys. So therefore we could do the calculation, uh, which we see represented here. So the probability of being of a species being detected at least once, given that the detection probability is 0.4 and given that that detection probability doesn't change, will be 0.87. So it's an 87% chance that the species will be detected at least once. Okay, so what do we do with that? Well, we're going to do much the same thing that we did with abundance estimation. Suppose that you went out to 100 sites and at 40 of those sites, um, you detected um, the species at least once um, out of those 100, okay? So the naive estimate of patch occupancy is 40 over 100, which is 0.4, okay? Now, we know that this is flawed. And for those of you who watch Daryl McKenzie's video, you'll know exactly why. And at this point in the course, you should also know why. If you were to sample 100 patients for COVID-19 and you detected it in 40, your uh, estimate of prevalence would be 40 over 100. But we know that that's uh, wrong because suppose you, try, you draw blood or take a nasal swab from a patient and you don't detect it. Well, you don't detect it for one of two reasons. Either the patient doesn't have COVID-19 or that particular swab simply didn't detect it. So all of the medical stuff that you're hearing right now, the, the limits to some of that and the problems with a lot of it that's popular in the popular media is they don't explain this, all right? So why is that important? Well, it's important because the naive estimate in this case of occupancy is always biased low. So the naive estimate is 40 divided by 100, okay? And it's 0.4. Now that would be unbiased only if the detection probability was one, but it's not, and it's almost never one, okay? So the detection probability is less than one, and if it's less than one, then we have to correct the count, just like we do in, in, a, in an abundance stuff. So how many sites were detected as occupied? 40, so we correct that by dividing the count by the detection probability, 
So in fact, our corrected number of sites that were occupied is 45.956. And so our estimate of psi out of the 100 is 45.96 or 0.45. So 45 or 46 of the patches were in fact occupied, not 40%. So again, you know, and I realize it gets some, it's, it's probably getting a little tiresome to, to have everything um, you know, referred back to coronavirus, but, but this is exactly the problem. The naive estimates of how many patients out there have coronavirus are always biased low because they're not correcting the number of patients, the number of cases by the detection probability. And this is a point that Daryl was making in his uh, video, and I'm going to make it again. Okay, so, all right. So the, the basic idea, though, you know, independent of that, is P star is used to correct the count, and then um, the proportion of patches that are occupied, psi, is therefore corrected by that uh, P star estimate or that corrected count, and you get the appropriate uh, adjusted estimate for psi. Okay, so the good news is, is that the, the basic tools that you've already developed up until now are, uh, don't change. We're gonna model all the possible stochastic processes that may result in the observed detection histories. And we do this in a manner that's strictly analogous to mark recapture models. So for example, um, here's a history we call it history one, that's 1010. Zero, one, zero. Again, we remember because we're assuming closure that that zero means that we missed it, and that zero means that we missed it. So this patch is occupied, right? Because we saw it at least once. And so we now know that that zero means we just missed it. Okay, so the verbal description, species is present at the sites or the sample unit was detected in the first and the third survey, but not detected or missed in the second and the fourth. So the mathematical translation for this is as follows. Psi times the stuff in the brackets. So let's start with the stuff in the brackets because it's the easiest. P1, you detected on the first occasion. 1 minus P2, you missed it. P3, you detected. P4, you missed it. Okay. So that's the probability corresponding to do you detect it or not. Now, the psi parameter is here because this is the probability that the patch was occupied in the first place. Now, clearly for this patch, psi is one, but for some other patches, it won't be. So psi is a parameter in the probability expression. That will be more obvious here when we look at the 0, 0, 0, 0. So four visits to a location, and we don't detect it on any of the four visits. So either the species is present at the site and was simply not detected four times in a row, or the species was absent altogether. All right, so here you'll see where the psi parameter comes in. So what's the probability corresponding to the 0, 0, 0, 0 uh, encounter history, and here it is. It's one minus pj, you know, to the fourth power. So basically, one minus p1 times one minus p2 times one minus p3 times one minus d4. So there it is, represented in a more compact form. Times psi. So it's occupied with probability psi, and you just missed it four times in a row. That's what this term represents. Or it simply was absent altogether. And that's what this term is. So remember uh, the basic laws of, of probability. If you have an or statement, it shows up in the probability expression as the sum, the plus. So it's either you it was there and you missed it, and the there with probability psi, or uh, it wasn't there at all, one minus psi. So the likelihood basically consists of probability expressions very similar to what you've already seen, but now with the new psi parameter. So just to make it really clear, here's the sort of very simple, simplest possible that you can have. You need at least two site visits in order to be able to um, determine detection probability. So you can have one, 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 zero, zero, one, or zero, zero. What are the probability expressions? Well, psi times P1 times P2, psi P1, one minus P2, for zero, 1, psi 1 minus p1 times p2, and the 0, 0 is psi 1 minus p1 times 1 minus p2 plus 1 minus psi, okay? So look at these last two slides a bit, make sure you understand what you're seeing, and, and then we'll kind of go from there. Now, again, more notationally, 
Uh, we simply are going to calculate the maximum likelihood of the psi and the p parameters given the histories. It's a nice multinomial. Uh, we can maximize it using the same basic technologies that we've used for everything else. And this is all built right into Mark. Now, as is often the case, we're interested in the impact of different covariates on the things that we're interested in. We might be interested in what's the relationship of certain habitat attributes, for example, on patch occupancy uh, or different climatological values on estimates of detection probability, which is going to then inform our, inform our estimates of, of occupancy and so on. Now, the thing with uh, patch occupancy models that we need to wrestle with is that uh, we have different types of covariates that we need to account for. Now, to some degree, these are similar to the kind of distinction we made earlier between individual covariates and environmental covariates. Uh, and except in an unoccupancy context, they're called site uh, or survey specific. So the site or unit specific is something that's specific to the particular patch. So again, think about the pond. You know, some ponds may be bigger or smaller, deeper or shallower. Some may be, uh, you know, have clearer water. Some may be more turbid. And so some attribute about the pond would be a site or a unit specific um, covariate. On the other hand, uh, on the particular day that you go out and you visit all 10 ponds, that day could be a really hot day or a really cold day, or you might, it may be raining. So a survey specific is one that applies to all of the ponds that you um, visit on a particular survey day. So a site or a unit specific is essentially analogous to an individual covariate. And the survey specific covariate is, is essentially analogous to an environmental covariate that applies to all the individuals or in the context of an occupancy, it applies to all the different sites on a particular survey. And when you're modeling things, uh, you can have both site or unit specific covariance uh, for both the psi parameter and the uh, detection probability, right? So in your likelihoods, you're going to be working with modeling both psi and the detection probability. And just to sort of keep things separate here, I'm using alpha to represent the regression coefficients on the loaded scale for the psi uh, model. And I'm using the traditional or more traditional beta coefficients for the logit model for the detection probabilities. But you can use site or unit specific covariates for both of those. Um, detection probabilities may also be a function of survey specific covariates. So you can use site or individual for both psi and p, but when you're talking about p, you can also use survey specific. You can't use survey specific for psi because we're assuming psi doesn't change over the surveys, okay? It can change amongst units, but it doesn't change over the surveys. Psi Occupancy state is closed. It doesn't change over the surveys in your study. So missing observations. So this is something I hinted at earlier when I said you could put a dot in the encounter history. Um, we all know in practice that you may not be able to visit all the different sites. This is going to be especially true if you're working in difficult parts of the world and your sites are widely separated. Uh, all sorts of reasons can get in, into uh, into the equation here. So we need to have some way of coping with that. And the dot notation works. Um, and it works in here. It's just a dash. And, and the reason that some of the slides are dashes and some of them are dots, there's another piece of software called Presence, which uses dashes. Mark uses dots. And someday, I guess I've got more time now than I had originally planned, I'll go through and I'll, I'll make them all dots, which is what you'll see in Mark. At any rate, so here we've got 101-0. So you weren't detected on uh, the fourth occasion. So how do you model that? Well, it's psi p1, 1 minus p2, p3, and then 1 minus p5. And you might say, well, can you just legitimately skip over p4? And the answer is, sure. Well, what would the term be? The term would be 1 minus p4. You didn't detect it because you weren't there. Well, if you didn't, if you weren't there, then p4 would be 0, and 1 minus 0 is 1. So there is a 1 in there. It's, it's just I didn't write it in. So the encounter 
history probability expression doesn't change. It's still a function of the p's and the psi parameters. And here's an example of the second one. It's occupied 1 minus p2 because you didn't detect it then, p4 and p5. So if you look at these for a few seconds, you'll, you'll kind of make the connection. OK, now missing covariates, that's different. So not going to the site is one thing. You can handle that. Missing covariates is um, not good. Um, you don't want to do that. So survey-specific covariates can only be missing if the associated detection survey is also missing. So if in your encounter history, um, on that fourth occasion here for the first unit, you just didn't get to it, you have a dot or a dash, but a dot for mark in your encounter file. So you didn't get to it. So presumably you also didn't in measure the site covariate and, that, and that's for, or the survey um, covariate, and that's fine, okay? Site-specific covariates, uh, on the other hand, can't be missing, okay? So you have to have um, site, co you know, specific covariates have to be there for, for everything. Okay, now let's go ahead and take another look at this closure. Again, a reminder, we're talking about the species level, not the individual level. So we assume closure that the true occupancy state doesn't change. We assume, uh, assume that the surveys are independent so that if you go visit the pond today, it doesn't influence the detection probability or the, or the occupancy uh, probability tomorrow. And for some kinds of situations, that's maybe a bit of a tenuous assumption. So we have to think about that. Now, there are methods where that can be handled. We're not going to talk about them here, but, but there are definitely technologies that you can employ statistically, which will help uh, deal with that. Uh, the third item here is no unmodeled heterogeneity. So there's no unmodeled heterogeneity, meaning we assume the same coin flips. And if we have different coin flips, we assume that those coin flips can be explained by the covariates. Okay. We also assume that the species are identified correctly. Now, this has kind of become a big deal, especially for situations where the species is detected based upon what I'll call a non-guaranteed way of, of identifying the species, right? You, you listen for it or you see something and you think it's the species um, and maybe it is and maybe it isn't. So the standard model that we're gonna look at assumes no false detections. There are lots of new extensions which allow for false de detections. And those are actually discussed uh, in chapter 21 in the Mark book in, in some detail. And so at least be aware of them, but we're not going to focus in on them during lecture. Okay, so there are a lot of issues related to occupancy that are important to understand. Uh, the first of which is that changing occupancy or thinking about occupancy means thinking about proportion of patches that are occupied. And that's a coarser grained thing to think about than abundance. It's also the only thing that's practical for big scale. So sometimes that's a, a necessary trade-off. One of the challenges that you run into with occupancy is how do you define a sampling unit uh, and what's a season, okay? How do you go about avoiding heterogeneity? Should you sample more units or should you conduct more surveys of the units that you have? And even if P is one or nearly one, some of those issues are relevant. So here's a very simple example of the problem. Here are a set of, of patches. There are one, two, three, four, five. So there's 100 total patches. And the individual patches are occupied. OK, and so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's nine total of these little patches occupied. But the psi parameter that you would get would differ depending upon your sampling unit. So here I've taken the landscape and I've divided it into four. And each one of those four has at least one individual in it, one individual um, species member in it. So psi is one. On the other hand, if I made a different decision and I divided it instead of into four units, I've got uh, 25 units, then the psi probability is 0.36. They're really different. And yet the underlying biological story doesn't change between these two figures. And so this, of course, is a problem. What we're doing is trying to 
make inference about the biological layer given the data that we collect from the sampling layer. And the sampling layer is often entirely arbitrary. So the moment that you hear people talking about you know, counties or grid cells on a map, a reasonable question is, well, how did you come up with that as the appropriate sampling unit? And the answer is, often it's not easy to come up with something that's unambiguous and objective. Okay. Is there a natural definition? Um, might some sampling units change through time? And this can become a problem. You might have two discrete ponds now, but in a flood year, the ponds become connected. So what do you do? Uh, at what scale do you want to measure occupancy? And that's basically part of what we're doing here. Is the species territorial? This is a really, really big one. If the species is territorial, then should you sample randomly with respect to the species home range, or should you basically do something else? Does the species move around? Is it, is it a herd that wanders over the landscape? If so, what does it mean then to detect a species in a particular habitat patch if it's actually moving? Um, is spatial closure important? Okay, and so on and so on. So there's a whole series of things that are really important considerations. And in the occupancy books that Daryl McKenzie and Jim Nichols and Andy Royal and Larissa Bailey and, and colleagues wrote, um, they talk about these sorts of things a lot. And if you're actually sitting down to do a real occupancy study for something you're interested in, you will spend a lot of time, or you should spend a lot of time thinking hard about the sampling issue. Okay, so this is really important. Um, and here's a, a graphical example that I'll do my best to carry you through. Um, I've decided it's not the best figure. It's one that gets used a lot, um, and I'll see if I can carry you through here. So. This very heavy dark line uh, that I'm kind of waving over here is the true relationship between occupancy, and here occupancy is on the logit scale, so it's either positive or negative on the logit scale, and some habitat attribute. So something about the habitat, and it's a nice straight line, okay? Uh, so that as the habitat attribute, let's say, increases, then the, the proportion of the patches that are occupied increases. Let's, let's just make that the story. And what these other lines represent are what that relationship would look like if you don't adequately control for detection probability. And these are several different examples of what could happen. All right, so if, for example, the detection probability is less than one and, the, um, and, and constant and not changing, then you get this other solid black line which at least is linear and monotonic increasing, but it's definitely um, biased with respect to the true relationship. The, the slope is, is definitely flatter. All right, so what um, simple detection probability being less than one, but, but constant over time will do, is it's going to negatively bias what you see. And that goes back to the examples we saw before about the count statistic. The count statistic is negatively biased with respect to the true one, and that's largely what you're seeing here. These other two are, are more problematic. Um, suppose that P is less than one and positively co-varies with the habitat. So let's say the detection probability is actually increasing with this habitat attribute, then that would lead you to uh, a line that looks like this sort of darker gray one, this sort of curved one, very steep slope. So it would allow you to overestimate or would cause you to overestimate the relationship between the habitat attribute and detection. And then the one that's really kind of a big problem, if you have detection probability and it negatively covariates with habitat, then not only do you not get the thing you want, you actually get something that goes the opposite direction when the habitat reaches some point. Okay, so you really, really do need to control for detection probability when looking at the relationship between um, occupancy and some set of habitat or any, any set of covariates, in this case, habitat. So here's an example. This is actually one of the very first seminal examples um, that occurred um, way back in the beginning days. So Daryl McKenzie was a uh, postdoc at Patuxent Wildlife Research Center. And these people from Frog Watch, uh, which was a study based upon a citizen science initiative to essentially look for uh, anurans in different frog or different species of anurans in different wetlands because of the 
concerns that were largely in the press, in the public media even, about the disappearance of frogs and toads from uh, everywhere. And so citizen science was, was in sort of invoked. This was actually one of the, the earlier applications of citizen science to look at things. And so they created something called Frog Watch USA, uh, National Wildlife Federation, USGS uh, sponsored it. And what they did was that volunteers would go for three minutes after sundown on multiple nights to these different locations. And they would basically be listening for frogs. They would do these acoustic surveys. There were 29 different wetland sites. This was through the Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia Peninsula area, the Delmarva Peninsula. There were uh, areas that were classified as Piedmont and Coastal Plain uh, as, as sort of different site attributes. And they did this uh, over sort of mid-spring um, to sort of, you know, early summer in the year 2000. Uh, at each of the different sites, the wetland sites that they visited, they recorded different attributes. That was it a pond or a lake? Was it a swamp, a marsh, or a wet meadow? They also happened to record the air temperature. Uh, and so all the sort of covariates that you might imagine potentially being relevant. And we're just going to look at a couple of examples here. Uh, so they... They looked at you know, American toad, and they looked at spring peeper. And what they found, these were the raw uh, occupancy data, the raw detections. 10 out of 29 uh, sites for the toad. And for the spring peeper, it was 24 out of 29. And so just look at the toad for a second. If we look at the toad, 10 over 29 is 0.34. So the naive estimate of uh, occupancy was 0.34. Well, you probably know what's coming. Um, the naive estimate doesn't account for detection probability. So if you model it correctly, uh, which is sort of represented here for very quick, simple models, you'll see that things are quite different. So we're modeling psi either as a function of habitat or as a dot model. Uh, psi is a dot model for if you don't do anything else because you're assuming psi doesn't change over the surveys. Uh, so here we've got psi either as a function of habitat or dot. Here it's a function of temperature or dot. And obviously, this isn't intended to be an exhaustive set of models. It's just to demonstrate a point. From each of those different models, here's the estimate of psi from those models. And here's the standard errors. And we can see that the naive estimate, 0.34, is much, much lower than the true estimate of occupancy. And this is a really big deal. Now, I started off by pointing out that it's a really big, big deal for something like COVID-19 because... What that analysis would suggest, if you were applying occupancy to that, would be that there are more uh, actual cases of COVID-19 out there than we're actually um, talking about in the press because of failure to detect. Well, here we've got um, the same kind of mathematical or algebraic problem, but the story is a little different. Um, so we started off by saying, well, you know, we're, we're losing our frogs and we're losing our toads. And... You know, maybe these were 29 ponds where there used to be toads, and now we think we only have 10, so it's 0.34, and that looks pretty bad. Well, in fact, uh, it, it's naive. It's negatively biased. It's too pessimistic. And so the general thing to keep in mind for uh, occupancy studies and, and counts in general is that the count is always going to be negatively biased. So here the count statistics suggest there's a problem. Well, that problem is an outcome of a negative bias. Maybe there really isn't as bad of a problem as you think, because when you correct the count for detection, you actually see that it's not 34% occupied, it's closer to 50%. And maybe 50% is still you know, not very good, but it's a heck of a lot better than 34%. Okay, so for an awful lot of studies where you're doing threatened and endangered and you think something's disappearing, you need to make sure that you're controlling for detection probability. Maybe what's changing isn't the occupancy. Maybe what's changing is your detection probability. And this comes up over and over and over again in a whole variety of contexts. And so if you take nothing away from 4120, that will be it. You'll, you'll never again just listen to or read or hear about some count, some proportion, without hopefully asking yourself the question, well, what was the detection probability? Because that's the key thing that drives everything that we've been doing this semester. All right, so now we're going to look at a worked example, a real worked example. And this example uh, I borrow from um, the spotted owl study. And as most of you know, the spotted owl, 
for a long time, um, before most of you were born, was really the poster child for the impact of humanity on uh, the habitat and problems that that might be causing, in particular in old growth forests, largely in the Pacific Northwest and regions in the Sonoran area in, in New Mexico and northern Mexico. Um, there's this species, the spotted owl, which is a obligate nester in old growth forest. It really doesn't do very well without it. And spotted owls appeared to be declining in number based on counts. That's your clue where we're headed. And so this became a very big deal because uh, conservation agencies were suing the Bureau of Land Management, also known as the Bureau of Logging and Mining, uh, more, more cynically, um, to stop logging in the old growth forest. And needless to say, because an awful lot of people in the Pacific Northwest worked in the logging industry, this was not a popular decision. Lots of fights, lots of acrimony, uh, lots of actual violence took place. And, and so they, they convened a very large uh, multidisciplinary study to really look at it. And one of the things that emerged was really kind of interesting, and we're going to by no means address it fully, but we're going to at least look at some of the ideas that they were thinking about. So here's the, you know, the spotted owl. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a small owl if you actually were holding it. Um, it's about the size of a, of a football, I guess. And uh, it was disappearing, or at least it was presumed to be disappearing from what you see here, this sort of old growth in the Pacific uh, old growth in the Northwest. Okay, so stop the logging, stop the logging, logging's bad, logging's evil, and that was presumed to be the reason for the disappearance of the spotted owl. Um, but what other people were also noticing is at the same time that the spotted owl seemed to be disappearing, there were, seemed to be more and more of the eastern barred owl. And the eastern barred owl is a much bigger owl and so one of the hypotheses that emerged not really that long ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, was that maybe the spotted owl wasn't so much disappearing because of, of logging and forestry practices. Maybe it was disappearing because of the invasion of the Pacific Northwest by the eastern barred owl. And the eastern barred owl is native to North America, but it's not native to the Pacific Northwest. So at one scale, at least, you could call it an invasive species. And so there was an awful lot of discussion. They, they finally broke down and are, are currently doing experiments to really establish whether or not the barred owl is not the only culprit, but it may be a main culprit in, the, in what seems to be some um, difficult times for some spotted owls in some parts of the world. And it really led to some weird kinds of dynamics. Um, you know, stop owl on owl killing. There were calls to go in and, and lethally remove all the barred owls because they were not from here kind of thing. Uh, and that's a really tough kind of political decision. This really should be a case study in the strategic decisions class because this is a perfect example of uh, the complexities of real world decisions. We're not going to deal with that here. We're going to simply deal with what is the empirical evidence to suggest that barred owls are potentially a player in thinking about the uh, spotted owls. And to do that, we're going to make use of some spotted owl data. So I'm going to hop out of uh, PowerPoint here, and we're going to uh, fire up Mark. And these are some data which are available in the uh, markdata.zip archive called NSO for Northern Spotted Owl Single Season Occupancy. Okay, and I'm opening it up here uh, for you on the screen. And this is a fairly um, fleshed out data set. These are real data. It's a subset from a paper written by Larissa Bailey in 20, uh, 2009, rather, in the journal Biological Conservation. Uh, and these are from some sites, 159 sites in Oregon. And they went out on six different occasions. Now, you'll notice from looking at the data, so each of these represents the territory. So spotted owls are very territorial. They're relatively easy to work with. The landscape that you're working in is not easy. You're climbing up and down mountains. But the owls themselves are pretty easy to work with. Um, they're easy, relatively easy to catch and so on. But because the, the landscape is so complicated, uh, they couldn't always get there. So if we look at territory one, they went out four visits in a row and then either gave up or couldn't um, get there on the last two, so that's why we see the dots. Okay, so you'll see a fair number of the site surveys uh, have dots in them, and that's not particularly a problem here 
in terms of the likelihood formation because that simply means that for those occasions, the P for that site uh, is zero. Okay, so six survey occasions. Uh, we have eight total covariates. So we're gonna have to type a, a fair number of things into our um, mark analysis. The first covariate is site specific. Okay, so earlier we talked about the site being like a pond. Here it's a spotted owl territory. So we have, I don't know how many sites, actually I do, 159 sites, 159 different spotted owl territories. And the first covariate is whether or not there was a barred owl. Okay, so we're gonna assume for the moment that we know for sure if the barred owl is there or not. They're a big bird, and let's presume for the moment uh, that you, you're gonna know for sure if they're there or not. So one or a zero. All right, so this is a site specific because at each site, each territory, you either have the barred owl or you don't. And so that's this column here. So a zero means no barred owl, a one means that there is a barred owl. Okay, so that's the first of the site specific covariates. The second site specific covariate is the proportion of the territory that's what's called edge habitat. Okay, so if you imagine a clearing, uh, the proportion of the total territory that's comprised of the edge between the clearing and the forest is what would be that. So here it's the proportion that's edge and it's, and it's zero to, to one. Okay, so those are the two site covariates. The presence or absence of the barred owl on the site and what proportion is um, an edge covariate or, or, or what proportion of the territory was edge. Then we have um, three through eight. And so here they are. I'm gonna focus in on, on this one for the moment. So this will be the fourth territory. What are these? These denote whether the survey was conducted either at during the day or at night, all right? So these are also going to be um, site covariates, all right? So you go out there and a zero means it was the daytime and a one was the night. So here's this particular territory. The first uh, three visits were made during the daytime and the next three were made during the night. And if you think about it, these are owls, it might make sense. Whether or not you detect an owl is going to potentially be different if you go looking for it in the daytime or in the nighttime. All right, now there is a nuance here that, that's referred to in the comments section up here. Look at the encounter history for site one or territory one. They went out four days in a row and then they didn't go the last two days. So the, the days they, the, they, in fact, they went out four nights in a row because we have night, 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 night. And that corresponds to the first four elements here in the encounter history. But they did not visit the site on the, the fifth and the sixth. So, in Mark, you can't have a missing site covariate, but because you were not there on those two days, then Mark doesn't actually use that information. It's gonna make P equals zero, at which point you can simply put in a fake value for some covariate because it's never gonna get used, okay? It's not a one or it's not a zero. We just put in 0.5. We could have put in 0.3, we could have put in 42, it doesn't matter because they don't show up. They don't show up because you never actually visited the site. So when you go through here, you'll see wherever there's a dot, there's a 0.5 entered for the day night uh, covariate. Okay, so there they are. We have eight covariates. We've got presence or absence of the barred owl. We've got the proportion of edge, and then we've got the day night um, situation. Okay, so what we're gonna do then is we're gonna analyze these data in Mark, and we're going to see if we can see at least how we build the models before we get too much further. Okay, so let's uh, close up the input file here and we'll start up program Mark. And we're going to start a new project. This is going to be the Northern Spotted Owl, Barred Owl Analysis, or whatever you want to call it. Our data type, if you sort of scan down here, you'll see occupancy estimation about two thirds of the way down. You click that and up will pop a whole bunch of different occupancy data types. Now, 
we're not going to focus in on uh, any of them other than um, the multiple, or excuse me, the um, occupancy estimation with detection, this first one, and then the uh, multiple state occupancy estimation, which we're going to look at a little bit later on. Actually, no, we're not going to look at it here. We're going to just look at this one. Occupancy estimation with detection less than one. Um, all of these other models are basically just extensions from it, which allow you to deal with different kinds of heterogeneity and detection probability, which we know from the closed abundance stuff is an, is a, an important consideration. We're not going to deal with that here. We're simply going to ignore it. I just want to show you the, the basics. All of this is talked about in some length in Chapter 24. So we select occupancy estimation with detection less than one. Click OK. We have six occasions. We only have the one attribute group, but we have eight individual covariates. Let me go grab the file. There it is. Eight individual covariates. If you forget what they are, you can go look at the input file again. There they are. It's the barred owls, the proportion of edge, and then the, the day and night for the next six. So I'm going to enter the covariate names. We need those. I'm going to use BAOW for barred owl. I'm going to use edge for proportion of the habit or the territory that's edge habitat. And then I'm going to have DN1 for day and night for the first visit. DN2, oops, excuse me. Press that. Try again. DN2 for the second night, day or night. DN3 and so on. DN4 and DN5. Okay, and I guess I made a mistake here. Uh, I got to start up here. DN1, try again. DN2, DN3, DN4, DN5, and DN6. Okay, there they are. So, barred owl, proportion edge, and then for the six visits, was it nighttime or daytime? Okay. Now, click OK, and we're ready to go. And go ahead and um, create your file. Now, it's a closed population estimation problem, right? It's closed with respect to the occupancy state. So just like with closed abundance estimation, there are no cohorts of new individuals. So there's a simple single one row PIM. Let's look at the PIM chart. Pretty easy. We've got P and we've got Psi. So this is, I guess, a partial reward for getting to this part of the course under very trying circumstances. Um, Things are pretty simple here in terms of the modeling. All right, so what do we have? We have PT and, and Psi. So I'm going to go ahead and just run this as is. I'm going to call this. Now, in the PIM chart, it's P comes first and then um, the Psi parameter. But in almost all the literature, the Psi parameter is talked about first and then the P parameter. I'm not sure why Gary flipped the order. Uh, I think it's because it's similar that way to the closed abundance stuff where you have F0 instead of Psi, but whatever. I'm just going to go ahead and say, so it's Psi dot PT. And this is the one that I'm going to build using the PIMS. Um, I'll use the logit link. It doesn't particularly matter here. And away we go. And there's our results. So what do our results look like? Well, our results look like estimates of the detection probability and estimates of the Psi, the proportion of the patches that are occupied by um, spotted owls. And so this estimate of 59% is corrected for detection probabilities, which are clearly less than one. OK, so there it is. And what would the uh, design matrix equivalent be? Well, if we do design, we can go ahead and pick full if we wanted. Um, there it is. This is our Psi T model PT. But this is done using the design matrix. Click OK. We should get exactly the same model fit, which we do. So I'm going to go ahead and delete my PIM version because it's redundant. And I'm content that my design matrix version is, is identical and ready to go. OK, so that's fine. Um, we don't need to do much more except now build some models. And we're not going to build a heroically large model set here. That's not really the point. I just want to show you a couple of things, and then I'll uh, uh, urge you to, uh, or I'll get you to look at the longer, more detailed discussion of this particular example in chapter 21. All right, so how would we build a model which said that uh, detection probability didn't change through time? Well, that's easy. We get through the, uh, we get rid of the time columns, 
So that would simply be getting rid of columns two through six. If we do that multiple columns, two through six, then this is going to be model uh, psi dot p dot, there it is, click OK. Uh, it does pretty well. There's our estimates of psi and our estimates of p. But we're more interested in covariates, sort of the backstory here is the role of barred owls. And so these are fairly easy things to do, but you do need to remember we have linear models for both psi and p. So let's start off by saying that the presence of a barred owl makes um, the spotted owl harder to detect. And why would that be the case? Well, the barred owl is a big owl. It's a nasty owl that beats up on this poor little, poor little spotted owl. So it's kind of like, you know, um, the spotted owl may not want to make itself uh, known when the barred owl's around because if the barred owl sees the spotted owl or detects it, the barred owl might go and beat it up or some version of that. So how would we actually do that? Well, all we need to do is go to our design matrix because this is where we have to do the covariates. And we're going to start with a simple model that says that the detection probability of um, spotted owls is simply a function of whether or not there are barred owls there. And we're going to assume, just to make things simple, that that particular relationship doesn't change from survey to survey. That if a barred owl makes it more or less likely to detect a spotted owl on the first day, it's the same on the second, same on the third, and so on. So how would we do that? Well, we're going to enter the barred owl covariate here. Now, I want to just show you something which I didn't show you before, but it's a convenient trick. We now have eight covariates. And when you have lots of individual covariates or covariates generally, it's easy to forget the name that you gave them. So in short of having written it down, there is something that you can do. And it's a feature in the right click your way to happiness thing. If you simply right click and go look down the list, you'll see individual covariates, about five or six from the bottom. If you do that, it actually pops up a little window with all of the covariates as you've named them. And then all you need to do is pick the one you want, Bard Owl. Click OK, and it's done. OK, so what we're going to do then is we're going to add uh, the Bard Owl covariate name to each of the things. Now, you could type it down this way. You could just type it in one at a time, or you can copy it down. So if you copy the value down, I got four more that I need to copy down for. Oops, I guess it was five. B-A-O-W. Anyway, there it is. I get rid of my time columns. So now that's three through six. Delete multiple columns, three through six. And now I've got a model which says that the detection probability is a function of the presence or absence of the barred owl. If I run that, I'm going to call this um, psi. So psi is still a dot model, and p is the barred owl. Oops, B-A-O-W, it doesn't really matter here. Click OK to run, and there it is. And oh, absolutely, uh, it looks like the presence or absence of the barred owl changes the detection probability of the spotted owl. And if we look at the parameter estimates, we can see that for that parameter, now I probably should have named it. Let me rerun this model, and I'm going to re rename the um, column so that when we look at the output, it's a little clearer. So this is going to be the third owl uh, covariate. So I'm going to just rerun that. There it is. Rerun. And I'll just delete the first copy of it. And so now when I look at my estimates, we can see, sure, it's negative. So when the barred owls are there, the spotted owls are harder to find. Okay, So that's that negative relationship. Okay, So there's one kind of a model that we might build. Um, but just to show you, we could also literally flip around what we just did. Maybe we think that barred owls don't have an impact on detection, but that we, they do have an impact on um, the psi parameter. So what we're going to do here is we're going to add barred owls to the psi parameter by simply adding a column to the right here. And this is going to be the barred owl uh, effect on psi. So I'm going to click OK to run this. And this is going to be psi bardowl pt. 
Click OK to run. And it does terrible. So the barred owl doesn't seem to have much of an impact on the psi parameter, at least based upon what models we built so far. So remember the story was, well, the spotted owls were disappearing because of the barred owls. Well, maybe the spotted owls aren't really disappearing. Maybe they're simply just harder to detect because the detection of the spotted owl is harder when the uh, barred owl is around. Hmm, interesting thought. And so on and so on. So let's just build uh, a couple more models. Uh, one more just to show you the use of that day-night covariate. Let's take uh, the one that we just built where we have psi to be a function of the barred owl. And we're now going to make the detection probability on each of those visits a function of day-night. So how are we going to do this? Well, we need to understand the day-night changes depending upon whether it's the first visit, second visit, or so forth. And what did we call those? We call those dn1, dn2, dn3, dn4, and so on. So we're simply going to enter them here. dn1, dn2, day-night 1, day-night 2, day-night 3, day-night 4. Oops, caps lock key there. Hang on. So this is going to be day night four, day night five, and then day night six. There they are. And I'm going to delete the time columns three through six. So delete multiple columns three through six. Click OK. And now we have a model which says that the psi parameter is still a function of barred owl. And the p parameter is a function of day or night. And we click OK to run. And there we go, and so on and so forth. Okay, So this model does a little bit better than some, but it's still nowhere near as good as our first model. But again, we're not exhaustively building models. And I will get you to look uh, carefully at this section in chapter 21, uh, which deals with this particular example in single season um, uh, analysis of occupancy. Now, we also know at this point that there are uh, estimates that we can derive. Okay, so um, if we look at the estimates of psi, there it is, 0.599. And if we look at the psi parameter, it's basically the same. All right, so the psi parameter is actually in the likelihood here, so we don't need to look at the, that. But we would do model averaging. Model averaging is pretty straightforward. In this case, it's not going to mean much because all the weight is on one model. But model averaging, uh, real, the psi parameter, there it is. Just click one box, can't be much easier. And there's your result, and so on and so forth. OK, so I'm going to stop here. This is the basic thing. The design matrix is really pretty easy um, because there's really not a whole lot to it. And so building the models won't take you very long at all. So what I'm going to encourage you to do after watching this video is now go into chapter uh, 21 in the Mark book and have a look at the example that we're working on, sort of work your way through it. And this is in section uh, 21.1.3, an example with covariates. And then once you've worked your way through that, then we'll look at the second part of this, where we're going to look at the dynamic or seasonable occupancy model, where we're looking at psi changing from year to year. All right, so good luck, everybody. And I will talk to you next lecture.